concepts that will help us have a better understanding of what's going on inside the heart as it generates a heartbeat. The first concept that we are going to discuss is the conduction system of the heart. Now, the conduction system of the heart is pretty much these special cardiac cells right here that are responsible in conducting signals that cause the heart to contract. The first cell is called the SA node right here or the sinoatrial node. By its name, sinoatrial, this cell is found within the right atrium of the heart. This is also known as the natural pacemaker of the heart because this is where the beginning of the conduction takes place. So from the SA node, the conduction goes to the AV node or the atrioventricular node. By its name, this can be found within the border of the right atrium and the right ventricle. The AV node is also known as the gatekeeper of the heart. And the reason being is that it gets to decide whether what impulse to let through. So if the SA node generates a weak impulse or there is a block here somewhere, the AV node will perceive that and will decide not to let the impulse go through. And instead, it will conduct its own impulse. So from the AV node, it goes to the single structure right here called the bundle of His. And from the bundle of His, the cells will continue and will bifurcate into two separate cells, one to the left and one to the right. And this will now be called the left and right bundle branches. And from the bundle branches, they will extend within the apex of the heart. They will be called the Purkinje fibers. So again, the conduction system of the heart begins at the SA node, goes to the AV node, next is the bundle of His, the right and the left bundle branches, and then eventually Purkinje fibers. So another concept that we need to discuss will be the inherent rate of these cardiac cells. When you say inherent rates, these are pretty much the heart rate we generate depending on which cardiac cell sends an impulse. So for example, if the SA node starts it all, and it goes all the way to the Purkinje fibers, this will generate a heart rate of 60 to 100 beats per minute. It starts from here, goes all the way to the Purkinje fibers that will generate a heart rate of 60 to 100 beats per minute. However, for some reason, if the SA node fails or there's a block somewhere here, then the AV node will kick in. It will generate its own impulse. And when this happens, the AV node will generate a heart rate of 40 to 60 beats per minute. And that also includes the bundle of His. The bundle of His also will generate its own impulse and it's enough to make 40 to 60 beats per minute. And if the AV node or the bundle of His fail, then the left and the right bundle branches and the Purkinje fibers will generate their own impulse and they have the capacity to make a heartbeat up to 20 to 40 beats per minute. So now, let us talk about EKG. It has different parts. We will start with this small bump right here called the P wave, followed by this tall structure right here called the QRS complex. And lastly, the last bump after the QRS complex would be the T wave. Let us discuss them one by one. Let's start off with P wave. The P wave represents atrial depolarization. During atrial depolarization, the two atria are contracting. Next up, the QRS complex. Now, the QRS complex represents ventricular depolarization. During ventricular depolarization, the ventricles of the heart are contracting. Depolarization is for contraction. So how would you know which one is which? That P wave is for atria while QRS is to ventricles. So if you look at the diagram right here, the QRS complex, it kind of looks like an inverted V. So V for ventricles. So when you see a QRS complex, think about ventricular depolarization. So lastly, we have the T wave. The T wave represents ventricular repolarization. This is when the ventricles are relaxing. Keep in mind that every depolarization is always followed by repolarization. So for every contraction will be followed by relaxation. That being said, the question is, 
where is atrial repolarization? So if QRS represents ventricular depolarization or contraction, and T wave represents ventricular repolarization or relaxation, then where is atrial repolarization if this is depolarization? Well, it can be found within the QRS complex. As you can see, the QRS complex, it's a tall structure. Because ventricles tend to contract stronger than the atria, they tend to mask the atrial repolarization. And so that being said, atrial repolarization and relaxation takes place after the P wave, which can be found within the QRS complex. Now, as a review, P wave stands for atrial depolarization. The QRS complex represents ventricular depolarization. The T wave represents ventricular repolarization. And the atrial repolarization is covered by the QRS complex. You can't see it, but it exists. So now let us talk about the segments and intervals in the EKG diagram. There are a bunch, starting off with the PR interval, the PR segment, the QRS complex, the ST segment, and the QT interval. But to make it easy for you guys, we are just going to talk about the PR interval and the QRS complex. These are all we need to do the EKG interpretation. The other segments, they are important too, but we don't really need them to interpret an EKG faster and more efficient. So this is your typical EKG strip. In an EKG strip, we have a big box. And inside a big box, we have five small boxes. Each small box is equal to 0.04 seconds. And so if in a big box, there are five small boxes, that means that one big box is equal to 0.20 seconds. But really, as long as you know that one small box is 0.04 seconds, we're good to go. So let us get on with our six-step EKG interpretation. First up, we have to identify and examine the P waves, measure the PR interval, measure the QRS complex, identify the rhythm, determine the heart rate, and interpret your strip. And we're going to talk about them one by one. Let's start off with identify and examine your P waves right here. The normal P wave would be present and upright. If the P wave is absent or inverted, then it could indicate a form of dysrhythmia such as a junctional rhythm. Next up, we are going to measure the PR interval. PR interval is the distance between the beginning of the P wave and the beginning of the QRS complex. What we do is we count the number of small boxes in between and multiply it by 0.04 seconds. Our magic number for the PR interval is 0.12 to 0.20 seconds. Anything more than 0.20 seconds could indicate another dysrhythmia such as heart blocks. Third would be to measure the QRS complex. Just like the PR interval, we are going to measure the small boxes in between the QRS complex. Our magic number is 0.06 to 0.12 seconds. Anything more than 0.12 could indicate a dysrhythmia such as a PVC. Number four is we have to identify the rhythm of our strip. It could be regular or irregular. And the way we do this is we measure the distance between R's. R's and R's. Some people use calipers to do this, but really all you need is an index card. Mark your R's and march them with the rest of the R's. If they have the same distance, then your rhythm is regular. Otherwise, they are irregular. Fifth step is when we identify our heart rate. Now, before we calculate our heart rate, it is very important for us to know that our EKG is a six seconds trip. And the way we will know this is when we find these three lines right over here. If you see these lines, this means that from the first line, up to the third line, that would be your six seconds trip. The reason why this is important is that if it is a six second trip, then we can do a technique called the six second method. And the way we do this is that we count the number of R's between these three lines right here and multiply them by 10. 
So for this trip, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, and multiply that by 10, that will give us a heart rate of 60 beats per minute. One thing to remember is that this method works best for irregular rhythms. And another tip that I can tell you is that you have to be very, very careful in using the six second method. You always have to verify that the strip that you're reading is indeed a six second strip. I know some teachers include strips that appear to be six second strips, but they're really not. They don't have these three lines right here. And students actually mess up the heart rate because they use the six second method. This method only works for six second strips, okay? Second method that we can use to calculate the heart rate is the big box method. And the way this works is that we divide 300 by the number of big boxes between two R's. Our magic number is 300. So for this trip, we are going to use these two R's right here. So we have one, two, three, four, five big boxes in between R's. And so using the formula, 300 divided by five, we have 60 beats per minute. This method works better for regular rhythms only. And this is actually the method that you can use if you don't have a six second strip in front of you. And the final step is interpret your strip. and the QRS complex. These are all we need to do the EKG interpretation. The other segments, they are important too, but the ECG and its electrodes. We're going to use a mnemonic that makes 12 lead ECG placement easy for EMTs, paramedics, nursing, and more. So let's get right into it. A 12-lead ECG uses 10 electrodes, which are the sticky pads placed on the skin. Be aware that electrodes and lead wires are not the same as leads. So many people get this wrong, and we're going to explain this in a minute, so keep watching. This will also explain why a 12-lead ECG uses only 10 electrodes. So again, a 12-lead ECG uses 10 electrodes. These 10 electrodes can be divided into two types the limb electrodes, and the precordial electrodes. The limb electrodes are placed on the extremities, and there are four of them. And the precordial electrodes are placed on the chest, and there are six of them. So what exactly do all these circles and colors represent, and what do all these definitions mean? We're going to go back to this diagram in a minute. But first, let's clarify some definitions, because a lot of people get this wrong, so do not skip this part. In order to obtain a 12-lead ECG, 10 electrodes are placed on the skin. Electrodes are the sticky pads that are placed on the body in certain positions. The electrodes allow the electrical activity of the heart to be recorded. The lead wires are wires that are connected to the electrodes, and they transmit or send the heart's electrical activity to the ECG machine. The lead wires are typically color-coded, and they need to go in the correct position. The 10 electrodes create 12 different views of the heart and the electrical activity of the heart is recorded from those 12 angles. And these 12 views of the heart are the 12 leads you see on the ECG. So a lead is a recording or view of the electrical activity of the heart from the angle of that particular electrode. Some of the electrodes communicate with each other, which is why there are 12 different views or leads from only 10 electrodes. There's so many things. Oh, I have keys. I can draw stuff. Hold on, hold on. Silver chest. Let's go. You guys know I like opening chests, right? Now that we know the definitions, let's go back to our diagram. So the circles you see are the electrodes, and the colors represent the color of the lead wire that connects to that electrode. But how do you remember where to place all the different electrodes and lead wires? Well, let's walk through a memory trick mnemonic that will help you remember exactly where to place them. Starting with the limb electrodes and lead wires, these are the ones that go on the extremities, and there are four of them. First, you're going to remember white on the right. This will help you remember the white lead wire, which is the right arm, goes on the right side. You'll place the electrode on the right arm, typically above the right wrist. 
and then you'll connect the white wire labeled RA for right arm. Then use clouds over grass to remember white, which is clouds, goes over green, which is grass. We already know the white lead wire is the right arm, so the green lead wire is the right leg. You'll place the electrode on the right leg, typically above the right ankle, and then you'll connect the green wire labeled RL for right leg to that electrode. Next, you'll use smoke over fire to remember black, which is smoke, goes over red, which is fire. The black lead wire is the left arm, and the red lead wire is the left leg. You'll place the left arm electrode on the left arm, typically above the left wrist, and then you'll connect the black wire labeled LA for left arm. You'll place the left leg electrode on the left leg, typically above the left ankle, and then you'll connect the red wire labeled LL for left leg. Again, many people call these limb leads. These are not leads. They're electrodes and lead wires that are used to get the limb leads. The limb leads are what you see on the ECG that are derived from these limb electrodes and lead wires, and they're labeled different on the ECG. I wanted to point out that you may see some literature and studies suggesting that you can put the limb electrodes anywhere on the limbs, as long as both sides are symmetrical with each other. However, studies have suggested changes to the ECG morphology the more proximal the electrodes are placed on the limbs, so make sure to follow your ECG and institutional protocols. Now that we know where to place the limb electrodes and lead wires, let's move on to the precordial electrodes. Remember, these are the ones that are placed on the chest, and there are six of them. The lead wires are labeled V1 through V6, and you can use the mnemonic Ride Your Green Bike on Pavement to remember the order of the colors. The R for Ride is to remember V1 is red. The Y for Your is to remember V2 is yellow. V3 is green. V4 is blue. V5 is orange and V6 is purple. There's also another memory trick you can use, so keep watching. But first, let's look at exactly where to place the precordial electrodes. This is important, so don't skip it. Starting with V1, you're gonna place the electrode in the fourth intercostal space right of the sternum. You'll then connect the red lead wire labeled V1. Use ride in the mnemonic to remember V1 is red. Remember the left leg was also red, so make sure to always check the lead wire labels. Next is V2. You'll place the electrode in the fourth intercostal space left of the sternum. You'll then connect the yellow lead wire labeled V2. Use your in the mnemonic to remember V2 is yellow. Let's skip V3 and go to V4. You'll see why in a minute. You'll place the electrode in the fifth intercostal space mid-clavicular line. You'll then connect the blue lead wire labeled V4. Use bike in the mnemonic to remember V4 is blue. Now let's go back to V3. You'll place the electrode midway between V2 and V4. You'll then connect the green lead wire labeled V3. Use green in the mnemonic to remember V3 is green. Moving on to V5, you'll place the electrode in the fifth intercostal space anterior axillary line. You'll then connect the orange lead wire labeled V5. Use on in the mnemonic to remember V5 is orange. Finally, we have V6. You'll place the electrode in the fifth intercostal space mid axillary line. You'll then connect the purple lead wire labeled V6. Use pavement in the mnemonic to remember V6 is purple. Let me show you how we do stuff around here. Actually, my department uses monday.com, so I'm good. The work management. Here is one more memory trick you can use. First, you're gonna use the colors of a traffic light to remember V1 through V3. V1 is red, V2 is yellow, and V3 is green. Then use the mnemonic BOP to remember B is for the blue V4, O is for the orange V5, and P is for the purple V6. I also wanted to make you aware of a modified version of electrode placement. You may see some literature placing the limb electrodes on the torso like shown in the picture. This may be necessary if someone has an amputated extremity or to reduce motion artifact if the limbs are moving a lot. Just know that studies have suggested potential significant changes to ECG morphology when the limb electrodes are placed on the torso. So if the limb electrodes are placed on the torso, it's good to notify the provider by writing torso position limbs on the ECG. Again, remember to follow ECG and institutional placement protocols. Here is a summary table reviewing everything. Remember a 12 lead ECG uses 10 electrodes and 10 lead wires. Four electrodes are placed on the limbs and the limb lead wires that connect to these electrodes can be remembered using white on the right, clouds over grass, and smoke over fire. The lead wire for the right arm is white, 
the lead wire for the right leg is green, the lead wire for the left arm is black, and the lead wire for the left leg is red. Six electrodes are placed on the chest called precordial electrodes, and the precordial lead wires that connect to these electrodes can be remembered using the mnemonic Ride Your Green Bike on Pavement. V1 is placed in the fourth intercostal space right of the sternum, and it's red. V2 is placed in the fourth intercostal space left of the sternum, and it's yellow. V3 is placed between V2 and V4, and it's green. V4 is placed in the fifth intercostal space mid-clavicular line, and it's blue. V5 is placed in the fifth intercostal space anterior axillary line, and it's orange. V6 is placed in the 5th intercostal space, mid-axillary line, and it's purple. Hopefully